room. I need to talk to y'all about Bridgerton season three, part one. It is so juicy. And there's some things that I want to talk to you guys about from a licensed therapist perspective. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to my channel. If you are new here, hey. But if you are a returning subscriber, you already know how my review videos go. And before I get into it, I have to give a disclaimer and let y'all know that there will be spoiler alerts all in, up, through, and around in here. So if you have not watched Bridgerton season three, part one, go ahead and do that. Go to Netflix, watch that. It's like four episodes. And then come back and chat with us in the comment section because it is about to get juicy. So for the people who have watched it, what are your thoughts about part one? I mean, there's so many things that I'm gonna break down and talk to you guys about, but I wanna know from your perspective, what did you think about part one? And even maybe what do you think is gonna happen in part two? Now, the way this review video is going to go, I normally would break it down by couple and do all of those different things, but I'm gonna do something different. I am going to take it episode by episode. And this is gonna make it even more interesting. So just like you and me, we have been waiting for or what seems like forever for season three of Bridgerton to come out. I mean, we was in a pandemic, all of the things was happening with TV and production and being on strikes and all of the things in Hollywood. But now we are back and in full effect and I am so excited. So episode one is called Out of the Shadow. And we see everybody coming back on the scene. We see Colin coming back from his trip from Paris, from Paris for like four months. We see Penelope coming out of hiding, which we'll talk about shortly. We see everybody just gradually coming back into society because you already know what's about to happen. They trying to find husbands and wives. We also see Francesca Bridgerton coming into society as well. So she is fresh on the scene, looking to find her a boo. Well, a husband. And surprisingly, but not surprisingly, Colin was seen as the male prize of the season. I mean, he was looking good with his little shirt off when they was in the little carriage. And you know, he was all flirty with all of the women. He was just so good with his words. They were drooling, okay, over that man. And they were a little sad to find out that he wasn't coming back really intentionally to take on a wife, even though we know how part one ended. What I love about Shonda Rhimes in this show is that she incorporates everybody and their mama Meaning, even though we know in real life there wouldn't be all of these variations, but there were so many different types of people that were depicted in this season. I would probably say way more than season one and season two. We see black people, white people, Asian people, people from India. We even seen someone from the deaf and hard of hearing community. I don't know if y'all caught that. We seen somebody in a wheelchair, Lord Remington. We seen so many different people who experienced different walks of life. I'm talking about different hair textures, height, weight, body size, skin tone, we seen it all. And that is the beauty of watching Bridgerton. You'll see a little bit of everybody in here. Now, a good chunk of all four of these episodes were centered around Penelope and Colin. Well, more specifically, Penelope is in her third season out. So that essentially means she'd been out in society for three times and nobody has chosen her to be their wife. She mentioned this term called a spinster. And if I'm being honest, I really didn't know what that meant. So I went to Google and a spinster is an unmarried woman who is past the typical age of marriage and is also unlikely to wed. A spinster is kind of like a lost cause. But what we see with Penelope, she was going through a lot of things. Remember she was in hiding because her and Eloise's relationship have basically imploded. Uh, she lost her best friend forever, essentially. She also kind of lost two best friends. She lost Eloise. She found out that she was Lady Whistledom. And she also lost Colin because Colin, remember he told his guy friend that I would never date or court or befriend Penelope or whatever the exact words were. And she heard him, she overheard him. So she basically distanced herself. He was writing to her in his travels and she just ain't said nothing to him. So she essentially lost two friends, Eloise and Colin. Then on top of that, she's considered a spinster. She has no prospects for marriage. And her mom was saying weird stuff like, I take so much pride in knowing that you will take care of me for the rest of my life. What? Now look, I know that that may not seem like a big deal to y'all, but to hear words like that from your mom, I want to 
want to say that that's going to cause some mommy issues, which are already prevalent in the feathering to the home in general. We often talk about daddy issues and daddy wounds, but in this case, I firmly believe not just Penelope, but her sisters too, have a severe mommy issue and a mommy wound because their mama is weird. She is more focused on money, more focused on securing their future, more focused on them having kids than actually loving her daughter for who they are and embracing them and being emotionally available to them when they are going through different seasons in their life. She essentially gave up on Penelope and Penelope gave up on herself too. But I think the coolest part is that at the end, we saw a little plot twist in episode one, where instead of Penelope giving up on herself, she decided to get this oomph. She decided to get this surge and this urge to be like, you know what? I'm gonna get me a new look. I am going to decide to want to marry. I'm gonna find me a man or a man is gonna find me. And I am going to up my game in regards to how I interact with men so I won't be awkward and weird. And even still in this, I don't know if y'all remember from the previous seasons, but Eloise and the seamstress, the lady who makes everybody's dresses, they're the only two people that really, really know that Penelope is Lady Whistledown. And also, before we move on to episode two, this is when we are introduced to the Mondrages. They are starting this new life, they are coming into new wealth, and they are learning how to navigate this whole hierarchical society. But let's pause before we move on to episode two. I don't understand why there's so much emphasis placed on getting married, placed on how beautiful you look, placed on having children, placed on all of these different outside things, but there isn't any real preparation on how to do it. We can wear all of the nice gowns, we show up to the balls, we dance, we do all of these things, but the mothers are not preparing their daughters and their sons <laughs> on what marriage truly is and what this process is all about and what sex really is because we see, we don't talk about it, but we see the Featherington's daughters not even understand what sexual intercourse is. They thought they were being intimate with their husbands and they really weren't, you know? And so there's a lack of sexual education. There's a lack of communication skills. There's a lack of just the basics on how to go about and navigate this process. I feel like they just throw you to the wolves and you figure it out as you go along, which we know does not work well. So in episode two, it is called How Bright the Moon. And in this entire episode, we are seeing the queen struggle with choosing her diamond. So the one person that she really thinks is the it factor in helping that person to find their partner and their husband, that's the name of the gang for this. But she hasn't chosen anyone and everybody is kind of in a frenzy about it. Lady Danbury is trying to pressure the queen into trying to pick a person and everybody is just wondering who this is going to be. But the queen is unbothered, honey. The queen is like, y'all are not impressing me. Y'all are not nothing, anything amazing. Y'all need to be better and then come back into my presence. And if you haven't watched my review video on Queen Charlotte, I'm gonna link it up here and put it in the description so y'all can check that out because it's good and juicy too. So since Penelope at the end of episode one decided to pop out with her new look and pop out, decide to get married and pop out with trying to distinguish herself from the rest of her family, she dresses a little bit different. She is showing up outside of the typical colors <laughs> and fashion that the Featheringtons typically have. You know, they have tight coiled hair and, you know, uh, flowers in their hair and all of these different bright colors in their dresses. And it's just like, that really isn't what people are attracted to. But she wanted to do something different and she did. And one thing that I noticed about Penelope and what they did with her is in the previous episodes and even seasons, they had her on very straight dresses, meaning dresses that were flowy, dresses that didn't show her shape. They were just kind of like straight up and down. But I don't know if you guys noticed, but as soon as she popped out with something different, they gave her a little bit of a waist. We know that Penelope is a bigger sized girl. She's a heavier set girl, right? But they gave her a little bit of a waist. They pulled, you know, this part back a little bit and kind of gave her a shape. And I said, oh, I see what they're doing now. They're trying to make her a little bit more attractive. They're trying to make her seem presentable and wanted by other people. And that even showed up in the way that they dressed her. Let's get on Colin for a few minutes. Colin in this episode was doing the most. 
Okay, not only was he just out here flirting with everybody and their mama, but he was also sleeping with prostitutes. I mean, we see him literally having threesomes with prostitutes that he paid for and all of those things and having a good old time. And I was like, Colin, you were raised better than that. And while we're talking about sex, I felt like there wasn't nearly as many sex scenes this season as in previous seasons. We know season one, woo! Daphne and her man, they were having all the sex, all the time, everywhere. This was soft porn at this point. <laughs> but we didn't see that as much in season three. We saw some sex scenes. We saw Colin Wild Out. We seen, you know, him and Penelope get a little spicy, which we're gonna talk to and talk about at the end of this, but it wasn't as many as previous. So even though Colin was wilding out and doing the most and being out here, with multiple different women and thinking that nobody knows when we all know what they be doing. We see Penelope and Colin start to engage in more of what, what I would call dating coaching. <laughs> Essentially, Colin was her dating coach. Now we know that she got feelings for Colin and Colin realizes he got feelings for her, which we'll talk about shortly. But we see him trying to coach her and trying to encourage her and give her tips and tricks on how to interact with men because she was acting awkward and being weird and you know fanning herself and just talking about random stuff that ain't got nothing to do with anything and the men were looking at her like are you well <laughs> is everything okay so colin was very much seeing that she didn't really have the skill set to reel in a man. And to be honest, that's up for question because she just is a different type of chick. So we found out that she has the skill set, but it just needed to be maneuvered in a certain type of way. And even though Colin was helping her, I don't know if you guys noticed, but he dropped some gym. He told her living for others is a trap, but if you choose to break free, the world will open up. I said, okay, Colin, with the gyms. He also posed a question to her, which I thought was so powerful. He said, why do you even want a husband? And I don't know about y'all, but that should be the number one Bridgerton question that everyone gets because they need to understand that there is a deeper or should be a deeper reasoning and understanding of why someone will want to get married. It isn't just because I need to have kids or we need to secure our lineage in the next generations. There's so much more to marriage than that. But if I'm being honest with you, it reminds me of our current societal norms today, right? We have these societal norms that says, if you're past 30, you're washed up. If you are past 35, you're considered high risk and you shouldn't be having any kids. Um, if you're single, something's wrong with you. We have all of these societal rules that we made up that are not accurate or true. And a lot of women hold on to those values in today's current times. And they think that if they're past 35, they can't have children. Or if they're unmarried by 30, that they're a failure. If they're single, it's a bad thing. And it's just like, no, 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 no. Everybody has a different journey and we have to learn to embrace our own journey. And if you want those things of marriage and kids and all of those things, you can have those too. Now, I don't know if you guys noticed, but there was a scene where Colin and Penelope had a little hand intimacy going on there. And this is when Colin broke a glass in the study when Penelope was sneaking up in the Bridgerton house and wasn't supposed to be there. She was reading his journal. We'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> but he broke some glass and he cut his hand. And she was just like, let me see, let me fix it. So she wrapped it up with her little cloth or whatever. And so we see like this intimate moment with them and their hands touching. And there's something that I have seen as a theme in season three, but also a theme intertwined through season two and season one where hand touching is very intimate for them. We see the Duke of Hastings and Dad Daphne like hold hands and briefly touch hands during different moments and we're like oh okay and we also see Anthony Bridgerton and Kate Sharma you know do this little pinky hand touch situation as well and we see these themes where touching hands 
um, is a very intimate thing for them. Now we know Penelope was dead wrong for reading Colin's journal, okay? Because she wouldn't want nobody reading her stuff. But what I think was done here was that they had to intertwine a similar interest between them two. We know as Penelope is Lady Whistledown, <laughs> she writes, she's a great writer. Everybody all over society is reading her printed articles, but nobody really knows that Colin is a writer and that he's good at it. But Penelope knows, she read, she sneaked and read, and she realized that he's a good writer. So I think that that's something that they will be able to connect with on a deeper level at a later time. But this little happiness and this little love situation didn't last too long between Penelope and Colin because everybody in society found out that Penelope enlisted Colin to help her find a husband. And that was the talk of the town. And that's what led them to Colin creeping on over to Penelope's house super duper late. I think he was trying to genuinely be a friend and to check in on her to make sure that she was good because her life was essentially put on blast in front of everybody. But this is where we see Penelope ask Colin for the first time, would you kiss me? Because Colin was apprehensive, like, no, I don't think this is a good idea. She was insistent that she did not want to die unkissed. She made up this story, this philosophy, this narrative in her head that she was going to be a Spencer. She was never going to be married. Nobody was ever going to kiss her. She never was going to do any of the things. And she didn't want to die that way. So she shared her first kiss with Colin. Can I be honest with y'all? <laughs> If I thought I was going to be a Spencer and never marry and never have any kids, I wouldn't want to die unkissed either. But I also wouldn't want to die not experiencing other things. So me being me, I would have went for more than that. I wouldn't have said, hey, can you kiss me? I would have been like, look, can you please take my virginity? Because I'm probably never going to experience what it's like to be intimate with a man because I'm not going to get married. So call me a little freak -a -leak if you want to, but I would have asked for more than just a kiss. Would you have? Be honest. <laughs> There's one more thing that I wanna to talk to you guys about before we move on to episode three, and that is Eloise and Penelope's relationship. I firmly believe that Eloise still wants to be friends with Penelope. I really do. I think that she's just trying hard not to be friends with her because she feels like she has to protect her family, she has to be loyal, and she doesn't understand that Penelope did everything she did and said everything she said in the newsletter because she was trying to protect Eloise. I don't know if y'all remember, but the queen suspected Eloise to be Lady Whistledom, right? So to take the heat off of Eloise, Penelope wrote what she needed to write in there so she wouldn't be ostracized and nothing negative would happen to Eloise. So she really did it to protect her, but I don't think Eloise sees it that way. But what I do know is that she still cares. And what I do know is that she is also a very funny person. You know, Eloise is very quote unquote likable in a weird way. She had all of the other girls at the ball chit chatty and laughing. And they say like, oh, you're a great speaker. You're an entertainer, you're funny. And that seems to be Eloise's gift instead of worrying about having kids and a husband and a man and all of those things and books. <laughs> like she has some other talents as well. Now we already talked about this a little bit, but I I want to talk very briefly about the lack of sexual education that's happening in all of the seasons. I spoke about this when I talked about it in Queen Charlotte in my review over there. It's because there is no preparation for these ladies of the real world of what sex and intimacy is. And I'm talking about for the women and for the men. For the women, nobody talks about what your body goes through. No one talks about the changes. No one talks about being horny. No one talks about masturbation. No one talks about any of those things because it's like a a taboo, a hidden topic that nobody should discuss or you shouldn't even find out about it until you get married. But how are you going to know what to do when you get married if your parent, especially your mom, didn't teach you? And also the flip side happens too, where no one is teaching the men and the boys about sex either. Nobody's teaching them so much to the point where they are going out and getting and being with prostitutes because they know that they're supposed to be saving themselves for marriage, but they choose not to. And then what? They have all of these children out of, I've been doing this a lot. <laughs> Y'all get the point. <laughs> but children out of wedlock, or they call them bastard children because that's what Queen Charlotte said she had to do. She had to hide all of her grandchildren that were born, you know, by prostitutes 
and outside of their marriage. And this is something that typically happens with the men. But I also see a disparity there because that means if the men are out having sex, even with prostitutes, they are more sexually experienced than the women. So they're getting these virgins who don't know what they're doing. And we getting these experienced men who know how to put it down. That just don't line up. Moving on to episode three. This one is called The Forces of Nature. And I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the Mr. and Mrs. Mondridge here because they play a pivotal role in how society is being seen if you are an outsider coming in. Let's think about it. They're not born into it. They just experienced this inheritance and it's because someone left their minor child, Lord Kent, <laughs> a whole estate so they were basically thrust into this lifestyle and it's very foreign to them and they don't know what to do they don't know how to navigate it they got all this money now they have a new home now they have all of these responsibilities and things and they're just trying to navigate it successfully but also they are having a hard time distinguishing themselves from their old lifestyle particularly the husband so the real question for him is is he going to close his club which he has built which he has worked hard to obtain, which he is seeing that it has, you know, some revenue sources coming in, but he's also seeing it plummet a little bit, is a perception in society that if you are of a, you know, particular higher ranking, whatever, <laughs> I don't even know what words I wanna say, if you are a higher ranking individual, it is understood that you're not gonna be having a regular job. And so him owning and working at the club is going to be frowned upon or looked down upon. So he has to make a choice. And as someone who's an entrepreneur in real life, I know what it's like to not wanna give up your baby and all of the hard things that you've worked for just to experience a new lifestyle that you didn't necessarily work for. So we see the Bridgertons telling them, hey, don't worry about it. Once you've matched, once you're married, you can do whatever you wanna do. And that's kind of true, but it's also kind of not true. Because what we see from them moving forward is them kind of just going to their own beat. You know, Miss Mondridge changes her outfits. She starts wearing a jewelry. She starts looking how she wants to look and dress. And they start sleeping in the same bed, even though the rules say that they're supposed to sleep in separate rooms. They start doing all of the things that they just want to do anyway. And while that's cool and all, it's also going to come with some repercussions that I anticipate for part two. If you haven't figured it out already, you know that I am going to do a part two on this. So make sure to watch that one too. One of the coolest things that seems to happen is that Penelope is getting some suitors because remember she changed her wardrobe. She's dressing nice. People are paying her a little bit more attention and giving her the side eye like, okay, girl, you're looking good. And now Lord Debling is coming on the scene and showing interest in Penelope. And guess who doesn't like that? <laughs> Colin. And trust me, everything is going to hit the fan in regards to that when we get into episode four. We see some new players come onto the scene. We see Lord Marcus, who is Lady Danbury's brother. I still don't know why he's here. It hasn't been revealed why he came, why Lady Danbury is giving him a little bit of an attitude, like, sir, why you here? What's the energy? What's the vibe? I can anticipate that he might be a ladies' man and he may be coming back <laughs> just to try to find another wife because he is a with a word. Lady Danbury is not having it because she sees that he is trying to holler at Violet Bridgerton and that's her friend. <laughs> so we're going to see how that plays out. But we also see Benedict Bridgerton start entertaining Lady Tilly Arnold and they have a little rendezvous. It was interesting to me that he's attracted to her because you can tell that she's much older, but obviously they just smashing, they just sleeping together, and there's only some type of physical interest. But what I'm seeing, I feel like Benedict likes her more than she likes him. So before we move on to talk about episode four, I think some themes that I've seen in this particular episode was be yourself, be true to who you are, don't try to be anybody else, who you are is enough. Like that was the theme all up and through this episode. So last but not least, episode four, and of course you know I am going to end with my final thoughts and my theories and predictions of what I think is gonna happen in part two. So you wanna stick around for that part. We see Lord Debling find an extreme interest in this episode called Old Friends with Penelope. 
Now they get so close and so tight to the point where he is anticipating marrying her. He already asked her mama. Her mama said, yeah, we were just waiting to see what Penelope was gonna say. To be honest, I felt like she wanted to say yes to lock in that security, to be in charge of his estate, so she won't be a spinster, so she can kind of have a different place in society. But what she really wants, and we all know that she really wants a love match. She really wants a love marriage. And being with Lord Debling is not gonna give her that. Being with Colin will give her that. But I'll give it to Lord Devlin. He put the clues together. He's seen how they were interacting on the dance floor. It's a little hostile. He's seen how she was looking out the window and looking at the Bridgerton home. He put all of the pieces to the puzzle together and said, yeah, bruh. Well, yes, yeah, sis. You got a thing for Colin and you need to work that out before you try to come over here and marry me. So simultaneously, while all of that is happening, I feel like Colin is having like this semi midlife crisis, even though he's not middle age yet, where he's rethinking everything. He's rethinking how he's been moving and navigating and has he been showing up authentically? Has he been flirting and doing things that he wasn't supposed to? Has he been with prostitutes and, you know, doing that and he wasn't supposed to do that? I think he's rethinking, settling down. He's rethinking marriage. He's rethinking his friends because they raggedy too. And he's really trying to go in a different direction and it's showing. It's showing so much that people are starting to take notice. People are saying, are you okay? Are you well? What's going on with you? And there's some change that's going on in the inside of him and it's evident to everybody. I think one of the most powerful questions, in addition to the other ones that he asked Penelope about, was he wanted to know, can love bloom from a friendship? And he posed this question to his mom. And I think his mom kind of knew that he was having feels for Penelope, for Penelope's. I'm gonna give her a nickname for Penelope's. <laughs> and she wanted to make sure that he's happy. And so she was the one who spilled all the beans and said, hey, yo, it looks like Lord Devlin is gonna propose to Penelope. You need to be at the ball and at the dance tonight. And so he got himself together and he showed up there to get his woman. Now, before I get into my final thoughts, we know how episode four ended. And it ended real whoo, risque and raunchy. And I was screaming at the TV like, what just happened? So we know that in the carriage ride back home, because Penelope was distraught that Lord Devlin didn't want to be with her, Colin caught up to her, hopped in the carriage with her, professed his love to her, said that he didn't want to be without her, essentially, and things got a little heated sexually. Not only did they kiss, but there was some other sexual activity. Um, wasn't intercourse, <laughs> um, but there was some other activity with the fingers there that got a little heated in the carriage. And he hopped out of the carriage and wanted her to go with him. And he essentially said, are you marrying me or not? And that's where we left on episode four of season three of Bridgerton. Now, my final thoughts on this is that we see time after time again that everybody in society is overly nosy and overly invested in their child's life and their lifestyle. Let these kids have their own life. Let them do whatever they wanna do <laughs> because y'all are spending all of y'all money, all of y'all resources, all of y'all time to trying to find your daughter, your son, a mate. They gotta look good. They gotta have this much money. They have to do all of these things. And it's so much pressure. It's pressure on the children, but it's also pressure on the parents too. And it seems like that's the only reason they wanna live is to live vicariously through their children. And it's like, if you don't have children or if your child is not successful or marries rich or marries into a good family, then it was like everything we've done and everything we've ever worked for is a failure. It shouldn't be that way. I also noticed too that remarrying is a thing <laughs> in society. I understand that people die, instances happen, all of those things, but there's so many widows and widowers and you would think that it would kind of just be like, well, maybe I don't want to remarry or maybe I want to take some extra time to heal, you know, and to grieve properly. But it seems like people are so excited to hop right back 
into an additional marriage. We see that with multiple people pending. I think we're going to see that with Violet and Lord Marcus. I think we're seeing that with Lady Tilly Arnold and Benedict Bridgerton. We're seeing those themes of people who have been widowed, whose husband or their wife died, and they want that. They want to get back into the game. And they also probably want to have sex too because we seen Violet Bridgerton talking about how her, she wanted her flower to bloom and it's still juicy and ready, basically saying she still wants to have sex. Here's my final predictions before I close out today's video. I am predicting in part two, even though I didn't talk about her as much, that Francesca will choose to be with either Lord Kilmartin or the other dude that the queen tried to match her with. I can't think of his name right now, but it seems like she's really interested in Lord Kill Martin, but if she goes with him and he is a choice for her, that essentially means that she rejects the queen's advice, who she tried to connect him with, and she may be outcasted and she may get frowned upon and looked upon differently if she doesn't go with the queen's choice. The other dude, yes, that was the queen's choice, but he wanted eight kids. <laughs> Francesca was like, look, I, I'm not about that life. You know, it seems like she had more to relate with in regards to Kill Martin. They love sitting in silence. He helped her with music and he has this fop. They have some similarities there and I think she might choose to go with him, but it will be a very hard choice to make. There's pros and cons for each suitor that's on the table. I already said this, but I think Violet Bridgerton is going to wind up sleeping with Lord Marcus. But that's a conversation for another day. I think that's gonna be on the hush hush and nobody's gonna know about it. And I think that that might cause some issues with Lady Danbury and Violet Bridgerton because they're good friends and they're close, right? They have history. And so I can't imagine Lady Danbury is going to be okay with her brother trying to sleep with or court Violet Bridgerton because that's going to cause some issues within their friendship. I also think that Penelope and Colin will get married. I think that they are going to bond over writing. But I also think that Eloise is going to snitch and tell and be the one to say, hey, hey, Penelope is Lady Whistledown. <laughs> and when she breaks the news to Colin, her family and the rest of society, all hell is going to hit the fan because her life is going to be re-ruined again and things are just not going to be good for her because Colin had already stated that when he finds out whoever Lady Whistledown is, he's going to ruin her life. So that means he would essentially be ruining his wife's life because Penelope is the one. In a weird plot twist, I also think that Penelope is going to be the first one to get pregnant out of her and her siblings, which means she is going to be the one to inherit the estate of the Featheringtons. So this is going to bring some jealousy, some envy, some extra ish around her and her siblings because she was always the outcast one. She was always the one that's a little bit different. We are going to see how all of this plays out, but trust and believe it is going to be juicy in part two. So thank you so much for watching another review video on my channel. I hope you will stick around, stay, subscribe, watch some other celebrity videos, some other reviews on movie and TV shows that I have. Make sure to watch the review that I did on Queen Charlotte and there's gonna be an upcoming review on part two, season three. Until then, I will see you in the next video. Be blessed. Bye.